played kickball together in New York in the 1980s. I'm not sure how many authors were involved in that, but yeah. quite a few. Um, and she's asked me to start off today by, uh, by reading a little bit of the preamble, the introduction to this book, Reservoir Year, which just came out from Syracuse University Press. And I, I'm just going to jump in because it, uh, it 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 does set up what the what the project of the book was, and then I'll read a a, a very short uh, excerpt from it, and and then we'll talk. So, the glasses go on. I live in the foothills of the Catskills, four miles from the glorious Ashokan Reservoir. For a year, I walked by its side every day in all kinds of weather, from pre-dawn to starlight. My usual path is a former roadbed on top of the reservoir's main dam. There's a small parking lot near the village of Olive Bridge, rimmed by wildflowers, hardwoods, and pines. You pass through a row of traffic barrier columns and take a few strides to the edge of the trees, and the world opens up a panoramic vista of water, mountains, and sky. People stop in their tracks and gasp. I once heard an awestruck child cry out, is that the ocean? Mom, what is this place? It's a good question. I spent a year trying to answer it, day after day after day. I was poised to turn 60, a birthday that can't help but rattle the ribcage. My daughter Maya was away at college in Vermont and I missed her bright energy daily. My parents were dwindling into their 90s and my dog had died. Chris was my first dog, a not so golden retriever mix we adopted when Maya was a first grader with puppy lust. Having a dog ensures that you spend time outdoors every day, however you're feeling, whatever the weather gets up to. And that lifts your spirits, whether you like it or not. It's not just the endorphins from exercise, but the subtle pleasures of noticing seasonal changes. What new flower has opened today? Look at the frost on that leaf. Are the robins back yet? It's a daily unfolding of wonder, a pause in a day that is otherwise crowded with too much to do. For 13 years, we took the same walk every day, at first circling the block in a three mile loop, later, a mile to the end of the road and back, and finally, a stop and go shuffle on a flat stretch of road in front of my house. I couldn't bear to walk my dog, my, I couldn't bear to walk my block dogless, so I stopped walking. It took two of my brother's friends visiting from St. Petersburg, Russia, to open my eyes. When I asked what they'd enjoyed most on their trip to America, Sergei didn't hesitate. The Ashokan Reservoir, where David had taken them that afternoon. Such magnificence. I was flooded with shame. The Ashokan is practically in my backyard, and I hadn't walked there for months. Twelve miles long and a mile across, divided into unequal halves by a multi-arched weir bridge across its wasp waist, the reservoir is an ideal reflecting pool for the Catskill High Peaks. The vast expanse of water allows a long distance view of a densely forested range that could otherwise only be seen from above. The Ashokan is a different kind of gorgeous in every season, in every kind of weather and light, but its beauty is built on a paradox. Beneath its great bowl lie the ruins of 12 communities uprooted by the city of New York in an arrogant turn of the century land grab that impounded the Asopus Creek to bring mountain water to an urban island that had outgrown its water supply. Between 1907 and 1916, more than 2,000 people were evicted from land their fam families had farmed for generations. Trees were chopped down, stumps grubbed, buildings burned, cemeteries exhumed. African-American and immigrant laborers died in labor camp brawls and industrial accidents. When the thousand foot dam was complete and the water began to rise, it flooded a valley once filled with farm fields and country stores, grist mills and black mills, blacksmith shops, bluestone quarries and railroad tracks, churches and graveyards. It's a landscape that gets in your bones. So uh, what I did was to start walking on the Ashokan 
every day it became kind of an obsession and I, uh, I, I didn't know at the beginning that I was writing a book. I thought it was just a personal project and I just took notes as soon as I got off the path. I didn't carry a notebook with me, but I would, I would come home and immediately write up uh, what I had noticed that day. The, I, the challenge was to go back to the same place again and again and find something new every time. So at the end of a year, I had 367 micro essays and for very first draft form, 367 because it was a leap year and I couldn't resist circling around to the day I'd begun, which was September 15th. And so I'm just going to read one of those entries. They vary in length from, you know, a single word, a line or two to, a, you know, a couple of pages. Um, this, is, this is one of the shorter ones, but it speaks a little to my mood right now. So I'm just going to... This is day 80, December 3rd, 1.35 p.m. Squeezing in a short walk between writing deadlines, a shiva call, and my word cafe class tumultuous sky, snowfall on western high peaks, rain slanting down from the north, pale blue sky to the east, shifting eye of God's sun ray piercing clouds in the south, all weathers at once. Agitated gray chop at cross currents, no pattern of waves. Something spirals up into the clouds over Broadhead Point, an eagle far and high searching for fish. This is life, too much of everything in all directions at once, the clash of storms and the beauty that rises, stirring our soul as it disappears. So Nina, um, it's a very, very beautiful narrative filled with incredibly poetic observations. Um, <laughs> One of the things I was curious about is how aware of you were you before you undertook this project of species of birds, species of flowers, the nature of rock, um, and everything that you were looking at? Or did your observations tell you to go back and research what you were looking at? I, I did. I did a lot of research as I went along. I got. I. I, I wanted to learn everything. I got. It's just uh, as you be. As, as you start spending time in a particular place and really looking at things, you notice more and more. And I would think, okay, there's that beautiful purple wildflower I've, I've, I've always seen and liked. What's it called? You know, what's that? What is that particular bird? I know it's a woodpecker, but which one? You know, and, uh, and so, yeah, I learned a lot on the fly. A lot of... I don't know what a junco is. <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> uh, junco is also called a snowbird. It's uh, it's it's slate gray on top and white on the bottom. They look a little like nuns. They're uh, <laughs> they're one of the, the the winter bird feeder birds that you've you know probably seen in your backyard. Not in New Zealand, but when you're oh, no. in New Jersey. But I, I discussed with you that um, one of the <laughs> things I most missed about New Zealand is the bird life because where yeah. I live, I live near um, uh, a sanctuary. And then the Parson birds and the caribou, I learned the old Maori names for them. And I'm like this girl from Brooklyn. Like I didn't see a chicken until I was in college. So to, it's a really this new discovery. And one of the things I thought about um, is that walking right now is one of the things we can do during this pandemic. Absolutely. I've never seen so many people out walking in my life. I, I feel like I've, uh, you know, my, it's, I mean, one of the things I love about the Ashokan Reservoir, and this is very much part of the book too. I mean, I read a relatively serious entry, but there's some of them are very much about the, uh, the human ecology of the place and local characters and overheard dialogue. And uh, it's, a, it's a gathering place for a complete cross section of a, of a very colorful community. I'm far there, from the only regular. And there's a plot. You know, there are the recurring characters that you see all the time. There are the eagle guys that are sitting there waiting to photograph the yeah. eagles perfectly. There's the sunset men. And at one point you make a joke and saying, is there a plot here? <laughs> you know, because when, when I sit down to read journal entries, you wonder like, is this going to be the same thing every day? And you know, is it going to be like, oh, what a beautiful sky and all the beautiful descriptions of sky. But there's a movement toward it and there's a narrative. and one of the narratives I, I suspect was healing. And Very much so, yeah. 
And as a bookseller, um, you know, which is the other hat that I wear, you wear about 17, I wear about three. Um, I'm always looking for narratives to give to people who are grieving, you know, other than the self-help narratives. And I will give them like Helen McDonald's Ages for Hawk, um, which is a, a wonderful book. book. And, it's has a new book. <laughs> and, um, and I think that um, there's a couple things going on in your narrative. You know, first of all, is there what you say in the preamble, which is this beautiful reservoir is built on the destruction of villages and lives and towns. So there's always, there's beauty and there's also tragedy. Um, right. and that's one of the recounting of the recurring themes in your narrative. You know, you start this with loss and they're recurring losses. Right. And then it seems like the way that you are able to find the ability to meditate on loss is by taking these walks, which then sometimes surprise you and bring you great joy and yeah. solace. It, it was after a certain point, like going to visit a secret lover. I just, I couldn't wait to get there. I, I, I'm a freelancer, so I had, and at, at that point I wasn't teaching full time. And uh, I had an online class at the University of Maine. So I, I, I was I, able to go at all times of day. And I would just, I would get into my car and think, I wonder what I'm going to find today. It became such a quest. Um, and that I think... I, I hope that my own fascination with the place and the fact that uh, that 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 I always found something new, oh, even and maybe even especially the days when I didn't much feel like going, you know, when it felt like a chore and a, like a you know kind of a promise to myself I I was too stubborn to break rather than uh, it, as soon as I got there something would happen and uh, and I would be excited by the whole thing again. Out of the video. And one of the things that. Um, I, I, I suspect that. is that, and you talk about as a writer, is patience. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's so sort of like you didn't go every day and you kind of make fun of the people who do that, that you see on the reservoir, you know, like the, like the joggers who are reading, who don't pay any attention at all to the beauty that they're surrounded by, or the people who come and they're, they're impatient, they want to get away. And there's this sense also as writing, as walking, you know, is that you have to have patience. You want to see an eagle flying over your head. It's not going to come when you call. Even yes, though at one point very much somebody true. does, right? <laughs> I mean, somebody does call. Well, didn't you, at one point, there's this magical moment where you picked up an eagle feather, which mm -hmm. I didn't realize is you're not allowed to pick up because they're right. considered... Well, you're not allowed to keep it. You, know, you can pick it up, but you can't keep it. Right. And then you, then you asked to see a bear, and you saw a bear. I know that's, 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 that's one of the wiggier things that happened out there. Uh, as uh, I, I, I still can't explain that. I was kind of facetiously pretending to channel a bear, and I opened my eyes, and there was a cub about twenty feet away from me. And oh, <laughs> this, <laughs> this magic works! <laughs> so that was the most extraordinary moment. I think it's almost like the epiphany of the narrative. Yeah. Um, and one of the things um, people might not realize, so you turned 60, you know, we're out that, that autumn of our life, but you know, your parents both lived in, and healthily and actively and physically into their 90s. So I think that your sense of longevity is a little bit longer than, than most. <laughs> However, in this last year, both your parents passed. In fact, your mother passed away just a few weeks ago, you know, and I, so I was wondering about, um, how you've been able to process that through the publication of the book and have these walks been able to heal you in some ways? I mean, or, or the focusing of doing these events? Well, they're both in the book. I dedicated it to them. I walked there with them uh, in their 90s. You know, they were both on walkers at that point. My dad continued to work until he was 91 and they didn't fully retire and move up here until he had uh, a, a a, a, an accident and uh, this was they lived up here part-time as a kind of a weekend and summer place um, and they kept talking about it as their retirement house but uh, it was home and I feel incredibly lucky that uh, that it was it was almost like a preemptive grieving you know I, I, I knew that that uh, I, I, I knew that I was looking ahead to loss and it was a way to kind of to, to literally to build a reservoir to, 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 to create a place that 
would be a healing space that I could come back to. And I don't think I knew that I was doing that at the time, but it was one of the things that I realized as the book went along. Um, I, there were some other losses during that year, uh, friends and, uh, and in the world, you know, it's it, the, uh, the, the reservoir year actually runs from uh, September of 2015 to September of 2016, which is, you know, four years ago and uh, feels like another world. It was, you know, I, I, I kind of wrote a period piece. It was pre-Trump, pre-COVID. It was, uh, you know, a time of, that feels now impossibly innocent. Uh, and, and there was, there was, a sense is that you know, as you were talking before about the layering of of um, of the the drowned towns and that history and the kind of haunted quality that that the the place has because it is it's a place of immense natural beauty, but it is not a natural place. It should not be there. It should be a little winding creek with villages dotted along the side and old farmsteads and a lot of woods, and instead it's this magnificent body of water. Uh, so it's it it has a it has a kind of alchemy to it you know it's a it's it's a it's it's a place that uh, and 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 one of the things that i noticed going back there again and again and again is how very changeable the skies are and the water is and not not just from day to day but from from minute to minute sometimes you know you'd be you'd be in in as the the short excerpt that i read you'd be in several kinds of weather at once and you look one way and you've got one view and you look another and you've got a different season almost uh and it uh it's almost like painting in plein air yes it, it is very much so and, you know, and in fact, I ran into people painting there. That's another thing people do. There's something about the place that seems to inspire creativity. The uh, the cover painting was made by uh, a local artist named Kate McLaughlin. Actually, the painting behind behind me. It's it's my sky right, right now. Yeah. And uh, and she uh, her people actually uh, were among the 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 first settler white settlers in the Asopus Valley, um, and. She is a 12th generation resident of, of, the, of Ulster County. And many of her relatives were in the villages that, uh, that were, you know, that were kind of summarily uh, destroyed by the city of New York. Um, that's her mother's family. And her father's family were Irish immigrants living in the slums that had no fresh water. So she really straddles the, the, the both sides of the story of the, crea the creating of the reservoir. And uh, There's a lot of um, metaphorical depth to the work. I mean, uh, the, uh, the Ashokan Reservoir provides the water for New York City. Mm -hmm. Your parents are in New York City and your child is in New York City. So it's almost like moving from one stage of your life to the other. So there is this, you know, inherent connection through the water, through fresh water and everything yeah. that means because it means life, right? Well, you know? My parents live not far from the Central Park Reservoir and there's one point in the book where, uh, where uh, I'm down there and I go for a walk on that reservoir and I realize that the water has made the same journey. I made you know 100 miles down down river and then you see a beaver you know, he's <laughs> it was and everybody there, else is running around like right. day well they type a new yorkers with their with their uh the head, headphones head earbuds on. on and uh there's a raccoon catching a fish and cleaning it and eating it you know feet from them it was uh it was pretty amazing so were you were you were raised in New York City? Did you go to school in New York City or No, I didn't. I I I, uh, I was born there. I grew up in the New Jersey suburbs on the Palisades. So uh, across the river and uh and a place where we went where my family went walking a lot. Even even uh, oddly in the middle of the winter we were kind of thermos campers. You know, we'd have uh, the one of you know Swiss Miss cocoa and the one of uh, of uh, Campbell's soup and uh, a couple of sandwiches and go out in whatever the weather was and uh, spend some summers in the in the Finger Lakes at Skinny Atlas Lake. Where my dad was from Syracuse, so um, and that was and your the book was published by Syracuse University Syracuse Press. University Press, Press. Right. A wonderful right. thing. Yeah. So um, one of the things I wanted to ask. I wanted you to read the, the bit about um, when you worked in Alaska. 
and oh, okay. how you what, how you learned how to observe and how that in in a sense because I'm always fascinated by how writers learn their craft and it's not just sitting down and writing or walking but it's looking and learning how to appreciate what's around you so I if, thought that was really a wonderful passage if the, if there's one thing that um, that I learned from the reservoir year it was attentiveness it really had to do with with uh, with with notice and and paradoxically the more times you do the same thing the more the more the more you look the more you see it really I, I, I kind of I, f I feel like at the end of the year I was just scratching the surface of uh, of that place okay this is uh, this is later later in the book this is uh, day 168 February 29th oh, it was leap year <laughs> 9 30 a.m. ice sheet gone presto Sound of waves lapping, glowering clouds, a light drizzle, a few small chunks of ice bob on waves. And I remember one day in Alaska when my skipper, I was working on a fishing boat, um, gaff hooked a stray chunk of glacier ice, vivid turquoise and startlingly dense. Oh, he, broke it. Sorry? he broke it in chunks with a hatchet and mixed them with rock salt in the outer wooden barrel of an old school ice cream maker. We filled the inside tube with wild salmon berries, like giant raspberries, the vivid bright orange of salmon roe, and sweetened condensed milk, and cranked till our arms ached. Best ice cream I ever ate. That year I spent bumming around with an ill-fitting backpack, in some ways the most lost I've ever been, and certainly the wildest detour off the beaten track, gave me more than everything I did right. My first produced play is set in Southeast Alaska, my first published story on Vancouver Island, my first novel on the Olympic Peninsula, fiction postcards from the road less traveled. The fact I'm a writer at all is a gift of that trip. My notebook's the one thing I could carry when I fled New York. The play I began on the train across Canada and the happenstance luck of a youth hostel on Port Townsend's gorgeous Fort Borden Peninsula or also the home of a U.S. Forest Service barracks where I found a day job and of the great Copper Canyon Press where the great-hearted cantankerous poet Sam Hamill taught me to set letterpress type and made me want to write things that came from my heart, guts, and brain. I'd already been piling up timber, high school newspaper, workshops at Wesleyan, the New Hampshire Summerstock Theater where Jeffrey Nelson and Jean Passananti were producing new plays by John Sayles and Adam Lefevre, but the flint and steel that ignited it came from that walkabout year, from walking by water and scrawling down details of birds, trees, and weather in notebooks. Full circle, migration path. A hundred or more northbound Canada geese clamor overhead, changing leaders in mid-flight, so the deep V curves into a shifting parenthesis. I think it's such a beautiful passage because it sort of says, you know, like when you want to write and you're in university and you think you know everything, right? So <laughs> you take all these courses and then anybody who's older, who's taught you said, go out and, and experience the world. And so you went to an extreme. I know a lot of people in our generation um, went to Alaska for some reason. Mm -hmm. Um, to, you know, to go out, to go work on salmon fishing boats, and and it, it, it encapsulates what it what it really requires to be a writer. You know, mm -hmm. it's more than just reading and the knowledge of everything that came before, but it's the ability to observe and appreciate the world around you and have that life experience that you always draw upon. There's a lot of reading too. I mean, you haven't read Moby Dick till you've read it at the at the at the wheel of a boat. <laughs> <laughs> you <see that? laughs> I did, and Far Tortuga. <laughs> you read this in a book about uh, turtle fishing. So how did how did yeah, listen to Jimmy Buffett CDs and eight tracks all the time? <laughs> you know? It's true. Do you listen to music when you write? I listen. No, to music. no, no. I listen to music when I'm thinking about what I'm going to write. I often play the same tape over and over and over again in the car because it reminds me of a time or a place or just a tone that, that I want, but I don't have music on when I'm actually writing. Why did you choose not to bring a notebook with you when you went out every day and to, and to go back to the car and write, remember, write out of what you remember from that day's walk? 
I just wanted to be attentive. I wanted to 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 be there when it happened. I didn't want to be missing missing you know, a bird, an eagle or a heron flying over my head because I was scrawled over taking notes. I, and I, I, I thought that it was important to me to, to just to remember that we actually are recording devices. You know, if you really pay attention, you, you, you hold the essentials. I'm a playwright. I'm, you know, I've got a pretty good flypaper for how people talk. And I thought, well, I'm not going to remember everything, but I'm going to remember the most important things. And I would kind of, I, I would uh, sort of memorize a little set of keywords that uh, I'd re repeat to myself as a sort of litany. And as soon as I got back to the car, I'd start taking notes. Sometime later during the day, I would type them up, create full sentences, you know, make it, make it into more of an essay. Um, and then you know, at the, I mean, the great thing about doing a book one day at a time is at the end of, uh, at the, at the end of the year, you have a first draft, but I had an incredibly repetitive first draft with, uh, with, a, a, it was the editing that took so long on this book. So, so how did you, trying to boil things down. Did you know you were writing a book while you were taking, doing this essay? Was that the objective? It, it became the objective pretty early on. I think within about a week, I thought, what if I did this every day for a year? And so tell us about the process of editing. So um, did you collect all of these essays and then give it to someone or I'm fascinated by that as well. I, I, I did the first pass of it uh, my, myself and it, uh, you know, the, the, the main thing that I discovered was that it really was exactly what I what you know what I tell my students about writing is you know, start in midstream don't uh, don't don't you don't always have to drive to the place get out of your car <laughs> give the weather report you know right. you don't need the whole on ramp right. you know you can you can just you can jump straight to whatever is the the essential experience that day and uh, you know and and hit the high notes and also vary things. You know, some, some things are, you, the tones had to be really different. The lengths of the pieces had to be really different. I found, I found that I tended to write somewhere in the, you know, somewhere between three quarters and a page and a half per day. And they were all either too long or too short. I either needed to boil them down to a little kind of, you know, haiku, a little maple syrup version of, of what I'd been drip, drip, dripping. Or I needed to add more detail so that there was more narrative and it became more interesting. So, uh, so uh, the pieces are, are 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 very different lengths and very different tones. Some of them are funny, some of them are strange, some of them are, you know, more more uh, more poetic. In the same way that the sky varied, I wanted the prose to vary. And it does. And there are bits of humor. And then you break the fourth wall occasionally and talk directly to the reader. When <laughs> like when you say, "Is there a plot here?" <laughs> so talk a little bit about your genesis as a writer. I mean, you know, I remember you from Wesleyan and you were a force, you were a creator. You know, you were kind of terrifying to me in some respects. Because <laughs> you, you know, I'm sorry. You like a, no, but in a good way. Do you know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. like you, you were a director, you created plays, you did, you know, you were a force. So, and when you left Wesleyan, did you go directly to, um, you know, to New York or to Alaska? Oh. And I knew you as a playwright. So how did the movement towards writing prose happen? Or do you do it all simultaneously? No, I, I, I must have I, I, I must have a short attention span or something. I seem to I seem to try different forms all the time, and uh, and they do overlap a little bit. I still write plays, but it's not my my primary work anymore. It, I that. I really started out with uh, with with playwriting because I was a theater geek and I loved uh, I, I I loved the idea of writing something that was unfinished that other people's performances would would bring to life. I wanted to be a director, and I moved to New York after after college and I had absolutely no idea how to be uh, how to be hired as a director, and I had a sort of very early midlife crisis. I was about twenty one, you know, <laughs> and I just thought. I don't, I don't know how to get my foot in the door. And I ended up doing this strange kind of, um, kind of uh, wandering year that, that was actually, I was on my way to San Francisco. I just had never been West. So I took a train across Canada. And when I got out in Vancouver, I sort of thought, I'm not leaving. I'm, I don't know how, but I'm gonna stay in the Pacific Northwest. I just fell in love with the landscape. And 
I, I wound up in a youth hostel that was, uh, that was a, a, housed in the same place that uh, the U.S. Forest Service Jobs for Youth program, uh, that uh, the kind of Jimmy Carter era uh, uh, Civilian Conservation Corps, it was called the, the Young Adult Conservation Corps, uh, was hiring, so I got a job, and uh, and then I one day I wandered on a weekend when we were when we were off work. I wandered into one of the other buildings on this beautiful old fort. It's actually the fort where an officer and a gentleman was filmed on the Puget Sound. <laughs> you know, these was it about that? Victorian buildings, and uh, the Washington State Council for the Arts is there, and Copper Canyon was the press and residence, and it's a, it's one of the best poetry presses in the country. And at that point, they were making small edition hand hand typeset and uh printed chapbooks and uh and there were all these writers blowing through there it was really an exciting place to be and i just started taking a lot of notes because everything was new to me and so what you know what had been a sort of a you know poor me he doesn't have a crush on me back journal turned into um a lot of note taking about natural things that, that I didn't know, kind, kinds of work and language and, uh, and just writing about the, the place where I found myself in a very detailed way. And one, of the, one of the things I want to talk about just to go back to Wesleyan is um, when we were at Wesleyan, and I think it's still a little bit like that, there was the 1837 theater, right? It was 1837, is that what they call it? And anybody could do anything, you know what I mean? So Wesleyan, yeah gave us this sense of 92 theater i think it was 92. called yeah so everybody was doing all these crazy things and you know that's where lynn manuel miranda started in these heights and, and mm -hmm. thomas kell was there a little, so, little later than us <laughs> yeah they were a little bit more successful than <laughs> but there was this incredible creative opportunity but it left us with absolutely no life skills you know I mean, I came to New York and I, w I had a seat at Artist Grant. Do you remember that? That was a year. I do. And yeah, and I was like reading to old ladies in the retirement homes in the Lower East Side and um, taking poetry for them, writing down po their poems. But um, yeah, it was an amazing place. Um, but it was so hard to adjust to the world after that, I think. I think, I think that's always true when you leave college. It's, you know, it's Even, just a... It's you really think so? I think maybe now, like you have a daughter that's graduated from college. Did she have the same experience as you did? Oh, yeah, a bit. But she did some internships while she was still in college, but uh, it's, just, it's just very different. So. so what was the thing that most surprised you about the book and writing down every day? And how did you know you had a book? And when did you know it? I don't. I have. I'm. I'm in uh, uh, two absolutely wonderful writers groups, and I, I was bringing in things, and and people were responding well to them. And uh, I, I thought, well, people are enjoying this as much. You know, they are enjoying hearing this. So, I, I don't think it's just for me. I think, uh, you know, I, I got a lot of encouragement from writer friends, and that was invaluable because the, the, the worry in doing anything this personal is that it's only for you you know that um that there's not going to, there's not that the cycles of a year is not a plot that uh that that following a an obsessive drive to do something even you don't quite understand is not necessarily going to be interesting to other people you know like i i think i i think i doubted this more than anything i've ever written mm -hmm. um, at the same time that i couldn't stop doing it so i, I eventually i think i just uh, with with a lot of help from my writer friends I thought okay if it if if this continues to uh to 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 draw and interest me it will continue to draw and interest other people I, one one book that uh, that I loved and that was very much instrumental in in uh, in becoming a writer was uh, a Pilgrim at Tinker Creek and Annie Dillard's uh, book, which is also a very personal book with uh, a lot you know, which is also kind of a backyard experience. It's not it's not a you know it's not a wilderness experience. It's uh, you know it's going out every day and looking and paying attention. And you have a lovely bibliography in the back of uh, mm -hmm. some of the great books about walking. Yeah. Um, my favorite being the Rebecca Solnit book, which made her career, actually. The Rebecca yeah. Solnit book. Oh, yes. 
Yeah, she's and she's written a, a lot of wonderful essays about walking and uh, and and uh, traveling and nature and uh, all. And she's an amazing writer. So I thought we have a few minutes before we can open it up to question and answer. So I thought if you wanted to show some of the drawings and some of the photographs that yes, you put a, this beautiful a, res reservoir, it'll you know entice people to a go there and b read your book. Okay. Well, I, uh, Maris, are you still with us? Can I'm, you? Uh, can I am you, here. I, I um, wanted to to uh, share the screen a little bit with the artwork in the book. I was, I'm really lucky that three of my favorite Catskill artists are represented here. I already showed you the, the, the cover painting by Kate McLaughlin. I also have um, Will Lytle. So can, can you bring, bring that up on screen rather than me? Yeah. I, I think this is that'll probably be clear, did uh, did a reservoir map. I, I told him I wanted a kind of 1950s uh, diner placemat feel to it. And he looks with all these little animal icons around. Oh, I'm so okay. sorry. That's okay. okay. Here we go. We've still got you here. Um, here. Here's the actual... Uh... Here's the map. It's coming up. All right. Well, meanwhile, we've got this one. Yeah. <laughs> you can read my email while we're on Zoom here, I think. <laughs> <laughs> my old desktop up there, this is very odd. <laughs> Never mind. I'll just hold things up. I think um, hold things up, here. yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and the pictures behind you, they're all of... Um, Great. These are, uh, there, there are also some hand-tinted lino cuts by Carol Zaloom. This is, this is a... Uh, and eagle, they they uh, they mark the four seasonal sections, and there's a there's a they're they're all on the wall, but probably a little too far to. And the one the, the one with the little house behind you is that's the little bear, isn't it? Uh, yes, that's right there. Bear cub. Yeah. And then, um, so those are those are quite beautiful, and they kind of um, accent the book. They're lovely little drawings. Yeah, there there are a lot of Will's line drawings scattered throughout, and there are these six um, six section headers uh, with, with, with that uh, that Carol did. And I, I just felt so lucky that the team at Syracuse, I sent all three of their work because I loved all of them and couldn't decide, and said and was hoping that they would choose one of the three, uh, and they 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 couldn't decide either. So they're all they're all in the book. So what about the eagles? Are the eagles there? Is it is it a permanent eagle nesting ground at the reservoir? It is, there's uh, there's a nesting pair that's been there for going on thirty years and has raised many many other eagles. They, you know that's a, it's a real comeback story. The bald eagles when you know in the nineteen seventies were were on the endangered species list because the DDT was ruining their eggshells and. Um, they've they're they're now prolific in in the Hudson Valley and other parts of New York State and around the country. So, but it, it but it is a thrill to see them every time. It's uh it's just a, they they are enormous and there's uh they they have the most effortless looking flight. I think that the, every moment in the in the narrative where you talk about experiencing one of them flying overhead or coming back with a fish in the mouth to feed the <laughs> the young eaglet um, is breathtaking. You know, there well, are you get to know the individual birds. That's not something. I mean, you know, I had seen eagles at the reservoir before, but I didn't realize that they had. You know, it's, it was like watching your neighbor go to you know commute to work in the morning to to pick up a fish. I, I and I would think, okay, there's a. I, I gave them the names, and uh, you know, I saw the one with the snaggled uh, wing wing feather was the one that buzzed me all the time, and I think she. I think. I, I made the assumption that that was the female because she seemed to be the harder working of the two. And also <laughs> females are bigger. It's one yeah. of the bird species where, where the, the females are bigger than the, the males. And, uh, and she seemed to like me or, you know. <laughs> you know. Do the baby eagles fly? Because one of the things I learned about living in New Zealand, we lived all the way in the South Island in Dunedin where they have an albatross colony. Huh. Is, one of the few places in the world where you can see albatrosses. Which is even bigger than a bald eagle. Is it, but the babies are bigger than the adults and they mm. can't fly. And so, um, you know, they, they sort of grow and then they fly around and they have this sort of things on their feet and then they come back to mate. 
and um, but they can't fly. The, the babies are so big. So I was wondering, are the eagles' babies that big? They are. They are very large, and it takes them a very long time to get out of the nest. Um, you would see the you know the teenage eagles perched on the edge, you know, and sort of hopping out onto a branch, and they look like adults. They don't have the white head and tail until they're about four or five years old, but they're they have they're they're enormous, and you keep thinking, why are you just sitting there? But, uh, <laughs> But uh, sooner or later, they get the keys to the car and they, they go out. And they, go off. And... they go off to college. Yeah. So what is the, what did you, have you learned about yourself through this whole experience? It's, it's not a, that's a, kind of a difficult question, but it, it is a difficult wild. question. I, I mean, I, I learned a lot, as you said uh, earlier on, about patience, um, about, uh, about committing to something and seeing it through. Um, and... I, 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 I don't know. I, th I, I really think it was just the. Uh, there was a calm that came from doing this, which has stood me in good stead. Um, it, uh, it, it did slow me down in some very essential way, which I think is why there's such a drive for people to go outside and walk right now. Is we're all so jangled by what's right. going on in the world and by the fear of disease and all this, and being outdoors is restorative. There's a wonderful Japanese phrase, forest bathing, which is which is the practice of of going going to the woods for healing. And uh, and urban people are you know prescriptively going to take walks and just be in the forest, and uh, I, I kind of came to it naturally because I live, I, you know, I'm lucky enough to live in a, a, a beautiful place that's near an even more beautiful place. So, so what has been the, um, the good and bad of publishing a book during a pandemic? Well, I wouldn't be talking to you via Zoom, and my, and the, I, I'm looking at some of the people up here and realizing that uh, that they live in all different parts of the country. They would not have been able to come to, you know, to Woodstock or Kingston or New Paltz or Poughkeepsie or any of the places near me, or even to McNally Jackson in the city to, uh, to, to hear me read. So that is, that, that is wonderful. But there is something about being in a room full of people that is, is very exciting. I miss that. I'm sorry, you know, especially because the book is so 19th century and feel, uh, it, it really is, um, it really is a kind of a pen and paper book. And, uh, and I, I was very specific about wanting to use handmade artwork rather than photographs in it because I, I didn't want something that literal. I wanted somebody's, in, in the same way that the words try to, to, to create a place in your imagination, I wanted an, an, an artist's imagined version of it. Um, and, there, you know, I always, I, I always figured we would, uh, we would all be, you know, in some funky barn somewhere <laughs> with a little homegrown music and uh, some wine and cheese and, uh, and uh, people's artwork hanging up on the walls and so on. So this is, but this is, a, this is a wonderful thing to, to, to do. It is, it creates a larger community, even if it's a more distant community. And your mother was, you know, your mother saw the publication, which is really she did. extraordinary. She did. And she heard one of your first interviews, which is really wonderful. Yeah, I honestly think she stayed with us to hear it. She, so. I'm sure she did. So Maris, are there any questions from um, our audience? I don't, I don't see any. You can, you can write in your questions right here in the chat. Um, I'm gonna write right here, <laughs> just <laughs> in case you wanna gather your thoughts and um, ask something. So if not, um, we can ask some more questions of, of Nina. Nina, is there anything that you'd like to say about the book um, before we say good night? Well, I would like to encourage people to buy it from an independent bookseller. <laughs> <laughs> support, your, support your local. Uh, I'm, I, am, I am just... Uh, 
thrilled that it's in the world. It makes me very happy. And I'm, I'm, I'm particularly happy to hear from people that they're reading it in such different ways. Some people have, uh, have, have uh, started reading on the day that they bought the book and are reading one entry a day. Some people are kind of uh, doing it in a box of chocolates manner, just, you know, flipping through it at random. What do I feel like reading today? Some people are reading it in a, you know, a season at a time and chunks. And it that makes me it makes me very happy that it has that that flexibility that that uh, that uh, people can have different kinds of relationships with it. And and one of the sentences I wrote while reading it is, is that it turns the quotidian into the transcendent. You oh, know? thank so you. Like every day, there's some miracle or some thing of beauty which you've commented upon, and I think that all of us can find that in our lives, and we're all looking for it right now. Because Absolutely. we feel a little bit stuck and a little bit lost, you know. Mm -hmm. So where do we find our energy, our strength, our inspiration? Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's around you, you know. Yeah, look up and out, you know. Got exactly. It, it, uh, there and wherever you live, there is uh, there there is nature which is changing daily, and there's a sky which is different at different times of of day, and it is. Um, it is it is healing to sit quietly and watch uh, watch butterflies to 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 uh, have birds coming to your bird feeder. There's uh, and there, you are very knowledgeable about clouds. You know, I'm married to someone who's an amateur pilot, and so oh no kidding, one of the things they learn is like how to call every cloud by its proper mm -hmm. name. So so do you. So my last question before we say good night is. Uh, tell us about your editorial experience, which seems to have been very, very positive. Well, I've, done, I've edited uh, uh, mostly with my friend Eric Lane, a, a fellow playwright, um, 14 anthologies of plays. I've also and worked with still sell that. So we still sell them at McNally. Oh, good. I'm glad, to, I'm glad to hear that. Plays and monologues. Yes. And, uh, and I also... Um, I've also been an, um, a magazine editor. I was a books editor for uh, Hudson Valley uh, Monthly called uh, Chronogram for a long time, which gave me the opportunity to to interview about 200 writers. I did a profile every month, so. That's uh, great. So there's a question, question from Catherine, and who wants to know, are you still walking the reservoir? I am, um, more irregularly because it's become absolutely crowded. <laughs> There's so many people walking there now. You don't want to be pulling your mask up every time somebody comes by on a bicycle. Um, but I had, I did find in doing the book that the most, uh, the there were things I would I probably not have ever done if I were not writing about them, like getting up at 3.30 in the morning to <laughs> see the peak of the Perseid meteor shower, you know, going out when it was, you know, 19 degrees below zero with an insane wind chill. And, uh, and those were often the most interesting and most moving walks they were the ones that where you really did not want to be there and thought, this is nuts. Why am I doing this? And I think having the structure of the book gave me permission to go out the door in, uh, in, in situations that I probably would have avoided um, going out. You know, I was there and, then, you know, I was the, the, the postal service, God bless them, you know, <laughs> neither rain nor exactly. clean or gloom of night. So um, I think that's about it. I want to thank you, Nina, for, you know, sharing the book with us and your life and the photos that um, I guess Will be are there photos of the reservoir on your website? There are some on my website, which is uh, ninashengel.com. Yeah. So and when we get you know, technologically more adept, then you know we can do it another time. But people, you know, I'm I, as I say, I'm I I. I I'm really kind of glad that uh, the reservoir exists in the in the imagination of everybody who's listening, and not uh, not not that photographs is not uh, photography is very much an art form and so. But I'm I'm a, you know I'm a person with an with an iPhone snapping pictures. I'm not, you know, so so I'm 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 very glad to leave the art to the professionals. Um, it's a beautiful book. Um, I was very moved by it. I think others will be as well. Um, we'd be happy if people could purchase it from us and you can do that on the screen. And I wish you the best of luck and a lot of healing and a lot of walks into the future. Thank you so much. Nina. My pleasure. Thank you, Maris. 
Thank you, Cheryl and Nina. Sorry, the visual component was not up to snuff, but uh, this is lovely. <laughs> That's, that, 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 that is just fine. We're here, we're here for the words. Exactly. And have a good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Take care.